from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know you're, you're busy, and uh, for those of you who serve Congress, which I know folks are, or are from Congress, you know, you're still in session. So we're, we're glad to have everybody here from the library and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center here at the library. And we're co-sponsoring this event with National Digital Initiatives. Uh, that's a group that its mission is to promote the library's digital presence here in the US as well as around the world. Uh, Abby Potter and I think Kate Swart are here uh, associated with that. Abby's the head of, the, of NDI, National Digital Initiatives. Um, is Abby going to raise her hand? There she is. If you want to know more about it, just, just uh, give her a shout, not during, the, uh, not during this event. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the, about the Kluge Center. For many of you probably don't know much, I'll keep it to about a sentence, and I'm going to steal from our charter, which says that the Kluge Center, is, its mission is to reinvigorate the connection between thought and action, the idea being to connect scholars with policymakers, one of the things we're doing today with Martin, and uh, the idea to uh, be part of the conversation about addressing challenges that democracies are facing here in the 21st century. So that's what, that's what we're about. Fundamentally, we have scholars and residents like Martin Hilbert, who's a distinguished visiting scholar with us, and this is, he's had, he's a recidivist. This is his second go-round at the Kluge Center, and he's, uh, and he's actually studying the library this time around. And, and we'll get more into that. Uh, Martin is on the faculty at the University of California at Davis. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about him before I launch into asking him uh, difficult questions. First of all, uh, he has two PhDs. Uh, it wasn't enough to have one in German from uh, ec the, uh, the PhDs in economics and social sciences from the Friedrich Alexander University uh, in, in Germany. He got that in 2006. And then he has one in communication from the University of Southern California. Uh, and uh, that was at the Annenberg School of Communication there. Before joining UC Davis, Martin created and coordinated the Information Society Program of UN Regional Commission of the UN Regional Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. In his 15 years as United Nations Economics Officer, he performed hands-on technical assistance in the field of digital development to presidents other government experts, legislators, diplomats, NGOs, and companies in over 20 countries. Uh, not only is he fluent in German, he's uh, not bad at English, as you'll see, <laughs> and, uh, and, and what, three or four other languages, I think. Um, to start off this conversation, by the way, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end, but to start off the conversation, I'm going to quote from how Martin describes himself when you, when you fish around on the web. He says, uh, I am pursuing a multidisciplinary approach to understanding the role of information, communication, and knowledge in the development of complex socio-technological systems. He also claims to be a really good translator. So you're going to start with that. <laughs> what does it mean? To what? German or to Python? <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping English. Okay. <laughs> Um, the translator, or what does the sentence mean? Yeah, what does the sentence mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, for me, um, yeah, both of them go, go very much together. I mean, the, the fact that it's complex systems or a multidisciplinary approach is kind of like the same thing, right? So uh, as for me, I see myself as a social scientist, uh, and they're not really, I mean, they're not really a lot of boundaries for me. So I'm interested in how digital technology changes society, uh, if it might be for society to satisfy its needs, mm -hmm. be it economics, how society governs itself, political science, or, or the little quirks that develops, you know, anthropology, sociology. So that doesn't, and that comes to complex systems, uh, approach comes to that, that there's an underlying mechanism that, that creates these emergent phenomena on a higher level. Yeah. Okay. This translator thing is more like because I came from the United Nations, you know, so, um, so I'm just in academia now for three years, for four years. So before that, I, uh, uh, I was for 15 years uh, at the Secretariat there. And um, yeah, I, I did research there as well at the UN Secretariat. Uh, it was a quite successful career. I, I had, at the end, I had lifelong employment with uh, lifelong global diplomatic immunity. And 
and, and what they call gold, golden handcuffs, right? So, <laughs> so I felt a little bit too, uh, yeah, I, I stepped out of that and I, I, I retired then early in my, in my late 30s, in my mid 30s and, uh, and joined the University of California. I mean, that's you know, the most complete, most comprehensive uh, tertiary educational system in the world. And it's a, it's a really nice playground because I wanted to be part of this revolution, you know, the digital revolution, more, more closely to it in California, certainly. Uh, there's, there's probably a lot of people in that system that think they have golden handcuffs, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, let, let's, let's get into the, to the substance, and we're going to start real simple, um, which suits me, uh, is that uh, I want you to define big data, just so we make sure we know exactly what we're talking about, particularly insofar as uh, big data about us, All right. you know, um, that, that affects us as citizens and, in, and, and as individuals. Yeah, so big data, uh, it, like for me, for the social sciences, how it concerns, concerns to us, I think, I, I, the term is not very lucky, and it doesn't always have to be big in order to make, make the difference in the phenomenon that we're talking about. It's basically, uh, for all the social science purpose, you can just replace the word with digital footprint. And then if you do that, you know much better what it is about. And, uh, and there are some other characteristics that maybe just maybe start with a digital footprint. Maybe we can pull um, my computer up. Uh, if, you, if you have here, um, if you have it on your phone as well, you can just, and you have a Google uh, account uh, logged in, you can just Google for timeline. And then uh, your Google timeline will come up if you didn't uh, change your default settings, which I guess nobody did really, right? Ever looked at that stuff now, right? So then you can see here, and you can see exactly where you have been um, during the last three years. So this is, uh, this is where I have been during the last three years, right? So you can see here, um, uh, I've been quite, uh, quite all over the place. You can also zoom in, and you can go very closely, uh, and you can see a particular, I don't know, let's take um, uh, 2014, uh, November, whatever, 14, right, and you can see here uh, where I was. I have no idea where I was. I was in London, check that out. Um, uh, and you can see exactly where you, where you went around and where you walked. You can even have a little animation uh, and, and see where you were. And you leave this digital footprint behind because basically you have this tracker, right, in your, uh, in your pocket that tracks you. And, uh, and even so, you don't remember the digital footprint remembers. But for any, for any practical purposes, if you're not absolutely sure, don't share this trick with your significant other. <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting conversation, right? Um, anyways, I, so I noticed I, you were in South Beach there. <laughs> exactly that was. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, and uh, so, yeah, that, that was it. That I wanted to show. So that's the digital footprint. There are some other characteristics. So you, sometimes the big data they describe with the, with the Vs, with the three or four Vs, uh, uh, that they have, so there's the volume, there's the big. Uh, this, I'm not so good with the Vs, I'm just going, and giving you four or five characteristics. Uh, we can turn this off again. Um, the four or five characteristics, so one is the digital footprint, the other one is that the digital footprint is always messy. So uh, it's, it's never complete, right? It's not like a traditional data form where we then, where we are complete and kind of like every row and every column is filled out. So there comes this technique then and it's called data fusion, which is very characteristic for working with these kind of digital footprints. So we have different sources that we basically mix together and the main technology that drove all of that called Hadoop is basically based on this as well, right? So it processes it decentralized and then brings it together again and we can really nicely mix different sources, which we need to. Now because not everybody's gonna be on Facebook. Uh, and not everybody's not even going to be on Twitter. But then you're going to have a credit card or you're going to have a cell. Like somehow we're going to get you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we try to fill out all these, all these different holes and, uh, and then complement different, different data sources. So, so what's the, if, if you had to put it in a, in a capsule, yeah. like, like distill, like, um, what are the various ways it's used that might affect, yeah. say, any individual's life? Right. So, so the state of fusion, for example, is that it gives us much better predictions because we can, we can uh, for example, you, you had always had data about yourself, for example, in the FICO score, if you, if you were to get a credit, right? You had the FICO score and you were always told, oh, get a credit card, you have to build up your FICO score and whatever. Nowadays, we use the state of fusion, we, we mix it with many other uh, indicators, for example, how you pay your cell phone bill uh, and even the way you move the mouse when you go over the bank's web page, right? There's a very high predictive power if you're going to pay your loan back or not. And, and with that, uh, they can predict default rate by 30% better. That means they can, they can offer credits 30% cheaper, 
right? So, uh, which is a big, a big gain, right? So by, by complementing these different sources. Uh, but also another characteristic of big data is that often is, it is often in real time. So for example, when you call a call center, the, the call center of your choice, you often hear this message, right? This call might be recorded for quality and, and, and you always think it's the head of human resources that listens in and makes sure you're treated well, right? <laughs> no, it's, no, it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, in, in most call centers nowadays, it's, it's up to 10 million algorithms that actually listen to you while you talk and, and from the way you talk, classify your personality into five different, different rubrics uh, if you're actions driven, emotions driven, and so forth. And then they match you with somebody on the call center on the other side who has the same personality that you have. Right, so if you're kind of like emotions driven, they match you. The, the people on the other side also, they don't even know about, you know, they don't know about that. They also just have their personality classified. But then if you're actions driven, so for example, I'm very actions driven, right? I call a call center and I want, I just want my coupon. I don't have a lot of time, right? And they really messed up for two days and I, I want to correct my bill or, or give me something, right? Uh, so if I would be, if I'm with somebody who is also actions driven, that's great, you know, we understand each other. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, she is not, she's, she's very emotions driven. She just wants to be really understood, right? <laughs> so when she calls in, I was like, oh, and, and so, so what did they say from the call center? And she's the, the, like, did they give us the money back or something? And she would say like, no, you know what? No, no, he said, uh, he couldn't help us. You know what, but he really understood me. Like, he, like, I told him everything, you know, with the kids, two days without a cell phone, at the doctor, how hard it was, and he really, great company, really great. They really understand us, right? So, so imagine I would have ended up with a person like that, right? It would have been really... Aggravating, yeah. Yeah, so uh, studies show that this, it reduces call duration by half and doubles customer satisfaction. AT&T always gives me somebody with a southern accent. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there's something in there. So, hey. so the idea is that, you know, in real time, we can also adjust to that, so if we do this data manipulation in real time. And, and all of that often done with machine learning. So these are some characteristics, you know. So the digital footprint, which basically comes for free, which we, we leave behind for free. Uh, the data fusion, that they're complementary sources that we can bring together. Uh, the idea of, of having it often in real time and then doing with machine learning, just throwing machines at it and looking for patterns that we don't even understand, uh, but the machines can pick up. So machines, just from the way you talk, can, can pick up your personality, right? By hand, that would be very difficult, but they dis discover these patterns. Yeah, so so um, to, to pivot <coughs> to politics and elections, All right. to dive right in. <laughs> uh, so those of us, uh, you know, we can, some of us can remember back when there's different ways that politicians and their consultants would try to manipulate us and influence us to vote for them. Uh, in the contemporary era, though, I think at least some people would say that, and, and maybe this isn't accurate, and you can s straighten me out, but uh, the Obama campaign in 08 made great advances uh, perhaps by plumbing our uh, social media habits, I'm not sure. But um, so what I'm curious is, is uh, uh, you know, clearly in the last 10 years or so, there have been great advances in, in, in efforts in campaigns to influence us. So what, ki what kind of advances have been made since then? Like what's going on now in campaigns yeah. uh, to, to try to influence us that's, that's, that's much more advanced than let's say uh, the Obama for America campaign was 10 years ago. Yeah, I yeah, think in two ways. One is it, it got a little bit deeper. That means we have more indicators and can make better predictions. And second, uh, it's more fine-grained, the data. And second, the, the, the samples are more uh, persuasive. So, so to, to pitch kind of like the Obama versus the, the, the election two years ago in 2016. So what Obama did there, he, he spent a, a billion dollar, right, uh, to set up this, uh, this, this project called Project Narwhal. And uh, the idea was to, to classify 16 million swing voters. Uh, and with these 16 million swing voters, the, um, they, they also did data fusion, so they took uh, voter registers until uh, TV setup boxes, whatever they could get on their hands on, right, and put that together and, and they created this database. It's kind of like patched together these 16 millions. And, and they run models, and then uh, with that, they pitched uh, tailor-made messages to, to the 16 million, right? So for example, on Facebook, if you think about that, just to give you an example, uh, one of the ways this is done. Uh, so on Facebook, if they know, but in political campaigns, it's actually very easy compared to marketing. Uh, marketing is much more difficult because marketing, you want people to buy one product. A politician has kind of like 
80 campaign promises, right? So it's very easy. Like of the 80, it might be that you're not in agreement with 78, but two you're gonna be in agreement with, right? So it's very easy to actually pitch because I just see, you know, what are you, uh, what are your interests are, and then you pick the two you're in agreement with, and then you create these filter bubbles, right? That's a technical term uh, where you just show him always these two messages, or actually on if some of your friends, one of them might have made click on the Obama campaign, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a post on their Facebook page not even a message from the campaign, but like a New York Times article that talks about how Obama is the hero of whatever, green energy. And, and you, after three months, seeing that, you think like, I thought I don't like Obama, but he really seems, my, all my friends say, he seems into that. And then, you know, you start to, you start to see the messages that agree with you uh, through these filter bubbles and the echo chambers, kind of like your friends talk about it, so there's a combined effect between filter bubbles and echo chambers. So what that then creates, what, what they achieved is they changed the opinion of 78% of the voters, right? Which is, which is big. I mean, um, uh, yeah, almost 80% of, of the borders that targeted, they changed. Now, what happened in, in the years th since then, first of all, uh, the coverage got bigger. So instead of going for, for 16 million, um, uh, the, the companies now really go for the 240 million, uh, right? So we have a profile of all of them. Or Facebook. Facebook, as, as you heard Mr. Zuckerberg two, two weeks ago here in Congress, right? The famous shadow profile. He goes for a, for a profile for everybody on planet Earth. Right, there's these two, two billion people that are on Facebook, but he has a profile uh, potentially for everybody on planet Earth, so, so seven, point, seven point something billion. Right? So that's, that's what they're going for. Um, and, and then you have much, much better coverage, first of all. Uh, and second of all, uh, the, 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 the information that we have got deeper. So the machine learning picked up some algorithms that allow us to make better predictions. For example, the famous psycho, uh, psycho psychologi the, the psychological profiles. Uh, what Cambridge Analytica supposedly worked with. So what that basically is, it came, it came from a study that a researcher did in Cambridge, a, 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 re, a, a researcher called Kosinski and his team. It was, a great, it was a great study. So basically what they did is they took, uh, they gave you a little survey on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. It says, well, test your personality in less than five minutes. Right? And then you say, oh, sponsored by the University of Cambridge. You're like, great, you know, and tens of million people participated, filled out the survey, and then they knew they were extroverted, introverted, or whatever. Uh, on these, on, between these things, you know, when you scroll down, the stuff you never read, right, the terms of agreement, it also gave them permission to scrape all their Facebook history. So, okay, so now these researchers, they had the Facebook history and the psychological profile, because you gave both of them. Then they had a machine learning algorithm learning that, and the idea was, how many Facebook likes do you need in order to predict the personality of a person? It's a machine learning problem, right? I have the personality, I have your Facebook, and I just say, like, how many do you need? It turned out like with 100 likes, you could predict uh, the personality extremely accurately. Right? And, then, and then they ask uh, the significant other, right? So your spouse, or your mother, or your father, or your siblings, right? Uh, your family, your best friend. Fill out this personality profile in the name of that person. I mean, your mother should know you, right? And it turns out that with 150 likes, the algorithm was better to predict your personality than your mother, right? And, uh, and then they ask you yourself, and what do you think? Are you introverted, extroverted? What, what do you think about your personality? It turns out with 200, 250 likes, the algorithm was better than you yourself in predicting your personality, right? <laughs> and that was a big study. Uh, Kosinski got a, uh, got a tenure track on Stanford for that, so he moved from, <coughs> he moved from Cambridge to Stanford and, and, and went to California. Um, and then this, this method was around and some other people in Cambridge, unlinked to Kosinski, right? Started to work with that, and that's where this company came from, Cambridge Analytica. And they tried to do the same thing. Now, it's unclear how successful they were in that, actually, uh, in doing the psychological profile, but we know there have been some attempts, for example, during the third campaign between Clinton and Trump. Uh, we know that uh, Clump, Clump said, uh, Trump said some kind of message, for example, I think, yeah, he def I, he de I defend the right to, to, to bear arms or whatever. Um, and, and they send 175,000 different versions of the sentence out, right? So the sentence is the same, but you kind of like personalize it according to people's fears, because that's the easiest thing, right? That's, yeah. that's what hits home most. So if there is a, a single mother, uh, they would pitch this message with a picture of a burglar. Right? And they could even find you in the picture of a burglar to a house that is kind of like close by, that kind of like subconsciously rings a bell. Right? Uh, and then and if there's a, a father, a, a sports father with three sons, they would pitch this message with somebody who was hunting. Right? And so they had 175,000 different versions. And the idea is potentially, you know, you have a tailor-made messages per person. 
right. and can send that Because, you know, in, in, uh, I, I did a lot of research on consultants who were working in the 70s, and, and they had it broken down at best to 480 you know, categories of people, right. and you try to pitch that way. So that's, right. it, it would be interesting to know exactly you know, whether you could measure how much better you're doing. But I'm sure it's a measurable amount better when you can, right. when you can be that refined. So, it's, so, it's, yeah. so it's, uh, it's a lot of what you're talking about isn't just figuring out who we are through the digital footprint, but then coming back at us. So you get this recursive th uh, model where they're coming back at us and hitting us with, uh, with content. Right. Uh, and, and maybe even news, right, to try right. to have an impact on our vote in this case. We'll talk about institutions in a second, but our vote in this case. Is that a, is that a good way to think about it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's basically, that's what these social media companies do, right? So to, uh, to keep with this topic of Cambridge Analytica, since it's fresh on people's mind, uh, people got very upset that they got, I don't know, 50 million or, or whatever, uh, 80 million uh, Facebook profiles. It doesn't really matter if Cambridge Analytica has 50 million, 80 million, 100 million. That's not even the discussion. You know, Facebook has 2 billion profiles and does exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Trump campaign spent $70 million on Facebook doing the same thing officially, right? So you don't need Cambridge Analytica for that. So the Facebook actually during the election, I mean, that's what Facebook does, right? It gets to know you and it's, it's, com it's a commercial company and it tries to sell you the ads and their clients can also be political parties. So actually they set up a team during the election and, and, and went to the presidential candidates. Uh, the pres all presidential campaigns, also from the primaries, spend $1.4 billion on, on these kind of social media ads. So that's a very lucrative market, right? So they send us specific teams that went to the, to the parties and uh, to the candidates and said, we're gonna help you. Uh, the Trump campaign was a little less organized. That's why they, they spent $70 million on it and, 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 and put like 6 million ads out. The Clinton campaign said, no, no, we are covered. We do that ourselves. They only put 60,000 uh, uh, ads out. And well, people say, you know, you know what happened. So, <laughs> so Facebook clearly, and that's about, it's not that Facebook went to Trump. No, they just go to everyone who, who wants to do business with them, right. right? It's a very lucrative market, right? $70 million. And then they did exactly the same thing. Now the question is, what's the difference if Cambridge Analytica does it or if Facebook does it? There's absolutely no difference, right? The question is rather, do we, uh, is this kind of model that's developed for marketing, you know, commercial marketing, uh, should we allow that or not for political campaigns? You know, political campaigns in, in many countries are regulated. In this case, on social media, they are not regulated, right? Nobody even has to tell you. Even on TV, you have to say, uh, also here in this country, you have to say if it's a political ad or not, right? And, and, and who sponsored it on, on social media? Nothing like this happens. And ju they just went in, made a whole lot of money. Much more money is made there. In the Obama, even in the Obama 2012 campaign, more money was already spent on, on social media campaigning than uh, was on TV campaigning, right? On big data was more spent than, than entire uh, TV ads, but it's completely unregulated. So the question is not is Cambridge Analytica or, or, or not. The question is if we should, if we want, you know, social media with that kind of granularity of information about us get into the business of doing democratic campaigning. So, so if, if you stipulate that, that uh, as citizens we're dependent on some form of media, uh, forms of media, to get our information to make decisions in voting uh, or to, to write a letter to a congressman or whatever. <clears throat> how radical is the change compared to however many years ago uh, in the way we're getting news? Uh, you know, because I, you know, I can tell you that my dad just got it from Walter Cronkite. <laughs> Maybe a lot of you haven't heard of him. Um, he, he was CBS News and all. But, uh, and that was it. You know, maybe he read a Cleveland newspaper. So, you know, it limits to what you could get out of that. Um, and that was it. Uh, but today, I mean, obviously that's an extreme, but, but that isn't that many years ago, you know, in the, in the right. greater sweep of things. So how radical is the change now in terms of where any of us might be receiving news that would have an impact on, on our, our decision making in politics? Yeah, yeah still, it's still changing a lot. So even the last year is still. Uh, so Last year, 60% of Americans, uh, Americans received news through social media, and this year it was uh, 70%, right? So, so is it that they're getting most of their news? Most of their news is about 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 20%, like they say, not, not so much. But it's, you know, one, one glimpse of something is enough to change your opinion, right? So yeah. it's not, even if it's not so much, you cannot get this image out of your head or this video out of your head. This video might be fake or not fake. You know, it might be made by an AI 
but you cannot get it out of your head. So even if you don't do it a lot, it still, still has a lot of influence, right? So 70%, and, and it's still increasing. And especially last year, we saw a big increase in, uh, in people over 50 years of age. Uh, they increased a lot, and, um, and, and non-whites. So non-whites, it's over 75%, like about 75% that get, get their uh, news uh, on, on social media. Uh, and the less educated, so the ones without a college degree that also still was increasing, or is still increasing that for that, and the ones with above a bachelor degree, that means with a post-secondary degree, it was decreasing slightly. So, it, but it decreased, like that's down down to 62% or something. But it's it's all it's all in the same. It's so, so the same it's not just that they're getting some news. They're, a lot of people are getting most of their news. Yeah, I think 50% get most yeah. of the news from there. Yeah, and uh, that would be, and that's going to differ. You're saying based on kind of a socioeconomic. Uh, based on social now, even so, I mean, I, I said these are different, these are small differences. So it means like if you're if you're highly educated and you're white, mm -hmm. you're like 60% of them, and if you're non-white and less educated, uh, it's it's 70%. But it's still like it's still in this range, you know. It's not so it's not such a significant difference. It's a really massive phenomenon. Now it comes through different channels. That's actually a more more different. So the average American uses um, about eight social media a day, right? So and some of them are much more news focused. Uh, Twitter, of course, right. the social media of, of the president, uh, then uh, uh, Facebook and Reddit. So these are very political. So um, yeah, a lot of people, let's say 60, 70% of, of what's happening there uh, is political. But then even others, uh, 20, 30%, 20, 30, 40% of other social medias is, is, um, uh, is news. For example, in YouTube, they made a big effort recently to bring up the news. and. Um, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Tumblr as well. Snapchat made a big move uh, in recent months, uh, getting CNN and others involved. You know, they have a, a special news shows on there. But even WhatsApp. I mean, 20% of people say that, yes, yeah, some kind of news they often get from WhatsApp, right? So you get it through all different kind of channels. But within these different social media, yes, yeah, some, some of WhatsApp is 80% conversation, 20% news. And so, so if scholars got to the point where they're, they're making uh, judgments, I mean, clearly we're, uh, being influenced because of our, you know, digital footprint in a thoroughgoing way, or, or people are trying to at least. Right. So, have scholars made any judgments about whether that's affecting how we're governed, um, or in what ways it's affecting how we're how we're governed? Yeah, I, I think it affects it in, in in many different subtle ways, and it's difficult to to actually to to point to anything. I mean. Uh, we saw it clearly in the, in the aftermath of the 2016 election. Uh, even so, we still don't really understand what's going on. But um, uh, yeah, but putting this, the question, the answer in a nutshell, I think, you know, in, um, let's put it like this. When in 500 years, you know, historians will come back to planet Earth and, and look what happens during these, th these decades where we digitalized the world's information stockpile in a generation, which is our generation, right? Uh, they will find that it profoundly changed the economy and healthcare and education and, and, and whatever. But I think the most profound changes they will find in retrospect have been the way that we are governing ourselves. So, so to answer your question, yes, I think the most profound way. But I think you can only see it from this bird's eye view because it's a, like we are part of this process, right? So I can go in and I can digitalize uh, a company or I can digitalize a school or, or a university or I can digitalize even entire government and I've been involved with these projects. It's basically a digitalization project, that's okay. But digitalizing, let's say, you know, society and how it forms its will, like we are like part of it. It's, it's, it's not like a project, right? Yeah. It's, a pro it's a process in the making and we are part of this thing, right? So we see some things um, that are happening there and, and we see some things that actually, actually go, go wrong. One recent thing that many people uh, pointed about is, is exactly this what's happening with Facebook, and that's why Mr. Zuckerberg was also mainly invited to, to Congress, to the Congress hearing, right? And it's basically these two companies, Facebook and Google, which are the two big elephants in the room, uh, which at the beginning of digitalization, it was almost like a, a left-wing socialist vision that they have to make information free for everybody. Uh, so their idea and their vision was like in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's very, it's, 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 it's very moved to the left the entire discourse. So the, the ideal was we create this information free for everybody and we have this brave new world where, where everybody can do for free. And, then, and that was great, the ambition. And yeah, you can use Google Maps and whatever for free and WhatsApp and it's all for free and Facebook and it's all for free. And yeah, they, they, implemented, they, 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 they implemented that. But with the cost that they sold, they made a bargain with the devil, right? They sold themselves to advertising. So actually, you, they had almost this, this left-wing ideal, and they, they created the, the tightest 
capitalistic machinery history has ever seen. Right? So everything that's going on on these two platforms especially, Facebook and Google, is mediated by some kind of commercial interest. And that was very different than back in the days when we paid our monthly uh, fixed line bill and, uh, and I was talking to you but nobody was in between. I was talking to you over the phone, right? Nowadays if I talk to you over Facebook or over Google, there are incountable commercial interests in between, which absolutely distorts the message, right? So actually by creating these communication platforms, having the devil in the middle kind of like, right? Many people ask themselves, wouldn't it be better if we go back to this, right? We just pay a monthly fee, which some other companies did, like Netflix, Amazon, and whatever with, with, with <coughs> Prime services. They went to this, like, let's go back how it was in the days. You just pay a monthly fee, and, you know, we're still going to do marketing, but we don't depend 100% on it. Whereas Facebook and Google, they are so in the corner because they 100% depend on that. They don't have an Amazon Prime to fall back on or whatever, you know. So, uh, I mean, you started this with the whole sci-fi looking back from, from 500 years in the future. <laughs> yeah. so, so put on your uh, futuristic hat, if you like. Oh, my. Um, you, you know, where might this be headed, particularly when you think about, you know, uh, uh, the advances in, in artificial intelligence in terms of how we're governed? Hmm. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, it's difficult, it's very difficult to answer, and let me put that in perspective, why it is so difficult to answer. Um, it's because we don't understand the technology yet, which is absolutely normal that we don't understand it yet. It's always been like this. So people say like, oh, we don't understand neural networks. We, we never understood the technology that we were dealing with. Right, but, but the, the end result is always we made much quicker advances than we always had, had, had hoped for even our widest stream. I'll give you a few examples, right? So uh, take the Industrial Revolution. Also, take all, all technological revolutions work like this. That's why also theory is so important. So technological innovation theory is very important if you're in this field uh, because the, uh, the, the fundamental theory of innovation has not changed. So uh, thermodynamics, right? The first Industrial Revolution, or the second, depends on how you count it. Uh, when Carnot, Carnot studied steam engines, right? So, so trains were already running. We had no idea actually how that, how that actually works. Uh, the equations that Boltzmann wrote down of thermodynamics, they came 50 years later, right? Um, the same with electricity. Faraday built the first electronic motor, and, and electronic motors were already among us uh, before Maxwell wrote down the electromagnetic equations. That also came 50 years later. Or, or take the brothers Wright. <laughs> so the, the Wright brothers, they, they flew the first time for 100 feet, almost killing themselves. That's nothing, that's like a large jump, you know, like 30 meters. We had no idea how fly, what flying actually was. We always thought it has to do with feathers, right? And at least with flapping your wings, because we saw everything that flew had feathers or was flapping the wings, and we always thought like, well, that's how biology came up with it, that's what it has to do, and since Da Vinci, we had this confusion. Then when the brothers Wright built the first flying machines, we understood like, oh wow, it has to do with the curvature of the wing, it kind of like sucks you up, you know? And then we developed aerodynamics much later, and 60 years later we flew to the moon, right? Yeah. So, so, that's, so we don't understand what we're doing when we have these new technologies, it's always been like that. But we make these huge jumps and we create all these different kinds of alternatives then, right? So we didn't only, not only that we discovered it has nothing to do with feathers, we built helicopters that have nothing to do with colibris, even so they have the same, uh, kind of like they can stand in the air, drones, uh, satellites, uh, rockets, uh, jet planes, you know. And right now we're doing the same thing with intelligence. So kind of like this information processor that Mother Nature came up with, uh, it's kind of like the feathers. It's kind of like the birds, right? It's one solution to the problem of intelligence, just like birds are one solution to the problem of aerodynamic and how to go about it. Right? But there are many other ways, just as there are rockets and, and, and hoover crafts and, 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 uh, and jet planes, there are many other kinds of intelligences. And right now, we don't understand it, and people freak out because we don't understand neural nets, but it will always be like that. And what we understand is like, oh, we are just one part of intelligence of this larger picture of, let's call it not the theory of aerodynamics or thermodynamics, the theory of intelligence. And we see where we fall in into that, right? So the fact that artificial intelligence comes in and that artificial intelligence, we see that these other intelligences are much better in some things. One thing they are much better at is executing laws because the algorithms, that's what it is, right? The other thing is they are much better being impartial uh, and being really neutral. That's what democracy strives for. Right, so the rule of law, uh, uh, neutrality, the democracy, the equality among each other, having the big picture, processing a lot of information, they're much better than this little, you know, 
nature-like solution we came up with, we cannot, you know. So all these different factors that we have, uh, we know this kind of intelligence is much better in that, uh, and it will lend itself to create a, a much more solid governance system that we have, but I, I don't, it's kind of like we are the Wright brothers and we try to speculate about moon, uh, uh, flying so, to the moon right So now. we know a lot more today than we did yesterday about artificial intelligence yeah. and how, to, how, how uh, essentially you're saying that, that uh, as an individual we're, we're, we're not quite as bright as some other way of you know, bringing information together and making a decision. Uh, you brought up the law, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about that. But I thought as a practical matter, do we know enough now, I think you're hinting at this, do we know enough now uh, to enhance policy making so that it would be more evidence-based and maybe less discriminatory, something that would you know, be in tune with, with the spirit of, of, of democracy? Yeah, uh, yes, I mean, there's the promise. There's not until now because uh, we, we don't have implemented until now, just because most of AI has been developed to optimize ads. Like, honestly, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so uh, but we know theoretically and, and also practically, like academics are working on it, uh, some other colleagues are working on that, that we can do that. So uh, one thing is to say, for example, the discrimination, that's a very good point that you mentioned. So, um, you know, we strive to, uh, for example, uh, uh, execute the law in, in a very non-discriminatory way, right? If the law says that, we should actually execute the law like this. And, and um, uh, the, the colleagues next door at the Supreme Court, right, they've been trained for 50 years of being really impartial and doing that. Now, we can show and studies show that even after 50 years of training, you will still be biased. You will still have stereotypes. You cannot get them out of your head because these are these variables like race, like gender, religious belief. These are these all embracing variables that are so powerful and have so much predictive power that this little processor that we have here loves to work with these variables. Because like a, a big, like a big bat, you know, like, oh, I just take gender and race and I can have all these little, so we cannot get it out of our mind. Now, algorithms can work with much fine-grained, much more fine-grained indicators, you know. So instead of working with gender, we can work with all these underlying indicators. Um, now, in, th in practice, they are not until now. So if you right now, there have been studies done, you take a, a neural net and you feed it with everything you find on social media, on Wikipedia, on all the newspaper articles, everything you find on the web. You feed it and, and you ask this algorithm who to invite on a job interview. Uh, uh, somebody with a male or female name, even so all the other qualifications are the same. It will recommend you a male name with, I don't know, 60% likelihood. If you ask somebody, is everything else the same except uh, the first and, uh, first and last name, Afro-American or European, it will recommend you uh, to go for European. And if you look into the neural net, you can, right? This is multidimensional space. And you see that African-American names, they are in the corner together with terms like prism and agony and violence. And European names, they're in a corner together with success and salary and, and, and whatever, you know. And, and who taught the AI such a racist view? Well, we did, you know. The AI, now it read 250 years of our writings and says like, oh, you guys say that goes together with that and that goes together with that. That's all the AI learned. It learned it from us, from learning 300 years of our writings, right? So now, but what we can do as well with AI is to say, since it be able to find break the small indicators below these big indicators, we can tell the AI, use all the information you can get, but don't use the variables gender, uh, uh, reli race, and religious belief, right? Do, uh, do not at all discriminate on that. Don't use them for information. You will inevitably lose accuracy, because every variable gives you more accuracy, right? Uh, uh, you will lose accuracy, but it turns out that you can design the algorithm in such a way that you lose accuracy very minimally. So if a person, for example, is 70% accurate, the machine is 86.6% accurate. If you take these three, four variables out, it is 86.2. Still better than the person. Whoa, well, much better. You don't even That's the point, right? Yeah, yeah, much better than the person. And we know the person will always be biased. The person cannot get these variables out of its head, right? The machine can with absolutely no discrimination and still be way superior than the human. So in theory, yes, uh, we can. Now, we have not developed that yet full to a commercial scale or applicable scale because nobody put the dollars on the table. I mean, we spend a lot of money. We, we employ 40,000 mathematicians in the NSA to keep Americans safe. We employ tens of thousands of programmers in Silicon Valley in order to get people the ads that they want. Uh, but nobody put the money on the table to say, let's develop some, some AI you know, to make democracy work. Like we don't have, and it wouldn't be a big thing, like just hire 10,000 programmers, 
nobody has been doing that until now. So these applications, in theory, they have a lot of potential to improve democracy. In practice, we have not started to look into them. So, so for, I, I, and being a, a Congress-focused person in my academic career, I think like, well, members of Congress have a lot of different reasons to introduce bills. We know that, right? You know, some of them have nothing to do with actually passing a law. I, that's a newsflash, I know, for a lot of people. <laughs> Because they have, they have other completely legitimate reasons to introduce a bill. But, if, but, but a lot of times they actually do want to achieve something. <laughs> it's good to know. Right. No, you know, and, and, and I'm trying not to be, uh, be, be snarky about that. But seriously, I mean, there, there are times you introduce a bill for, other pur for purposes that aren't about you know, legislative product at the end of the day. But there are times when it is about that. Uh -huh. So what, would there be some way to figure out how to craft a bill that would take advantage of an intelligence that's better than, say, I'm a congressman and, and, and you three were my staff and us just having a brainstorming? There's got to be a better way, right, based on what yeah, you said? Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, so I think the best, uh, one of the things is, it's, is this amazing thing that, so for example, the bills, for example, how that works, right? We have a one-dimensional scale left and right. And usually we divide opinions up, oh, you're left or you're right, right? And in, in most countries around the world, it's like that. So that's one dimension. Opinion doesn't have one dimension. Opinion has many dimensions, right? So you have 800 dimensions, 2,000 dimensions um, that you have uh, in, in a big space. And, and you can see actually where things hang to. Actually, that's another thing. We can, we can play around with that. If you turn on the, the computer again, uh, you can go to that. So that's an AI. Most companies actually opened up the neural nets, so you can actually go there. They opened up because they're a little scared of it. You know, so like, no, we have a terminator in the basement. We just want you to know we have one. Have a look at it. You know, they don't give you uh, like the, the they give you like an empty brain, right? They don't give you the tr brain that they trained for 20 years with their data. It's kind of like they have the the Ivy League graduate, and that's what they make money with. And they give you like the newborn baby and say, here you go. But you could train it yourself, right? At least they give you the the architecture, right? So you can go here. One, for example, is uh, projector TensorFlow. And that's one of these uh, uh, deep neural net that allows you to, to represent words. So this here is a 200-dimensional space, well, shown in a three-dimensional space. Uh, I, once ask, I once asked one of these computer scientists how they imagine 200 dimensions, uh, because I can only imagine three. And he said, well, that's easy. You, you close your eyes, and, and then you scream very loudly, 200. <laughs> All right, so no, they also cannot, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in here you can see, you know, you can kind of like zoom in and you see it's all these are words here, right? And they hang together, these words, in different corners. And then you can see, for example, here, uh, let's see if we have Congress. Uh, yeah, we can see Congress here, and then we can see the 100 neighboring words of that. Jefferson, Washington, Vienna, interesting, House, Presidency, Senate, uh, policy and so forth, act, library. Oh, look, library is here too, next to Congress. So, so that depends on how this uh, network was trained, uh, how this neural net was trained. And uh, you can project it now onto a three-dimensional space as well, and you get these kind of shapes, um, these three-dimensional sh uh, shapes. Uh, so it calculates it now and, and breaks these two dimensions down into three dimensions. And you can really a shape, like the shape what I said you before, what I told you before. So people with African-American names are in the corner with these kind of concepts, and, and that's basically what that is. So now uh, it, brings, it breaks it down. It's called TISNY, this algorithm that people swear it's the best dimension reduction algorithm we have seen uh, for these kind of purposes. Uh, and you can actually see kind of like a shape uh, forming um, over time here. Uh, and then and then see where it hangs out. So when you are when you're here, maybe we can stop that now. And you can move this around, right? And you can actually see this word cloud uh, word cloud here. And then you can look at different corners. Let's, for example, look at this corner: uh, Tim, Tom, Steve, Barry. So these all seems to be uh, last names. Maybe let's look at another another uh, first names. These look at another corner. Oops, where am I here? Macintosh, IBM, PC, okay, this, uh, this is also songwriter, writer, reformed, entrepreneur, so these seems to be methodologist, scholar, so these names basketball, so these seems to be kind of like jobs or entertainment, and you can now see like which words kind of like hang together, and whatever you train it with, right, you will see different things that, oh, here's Alabama, Mississippi, Indiana, so these seems to all be states that have to do with each other. Now, nobody told this network what actually to do. Basically, how they work is they do a prediction game. 
they read this entire text and to try to predict future, future words or sentences based on previous words and sentences. So it's all a syntax. There's no semantic. Text. The semantic is the result of syntax. Syntax, we always thought is different things. No, we can get, some, we can get meaning just from, from structure, which is an amazing thing we, 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 once we have the big data. Now, you imagine you do a thing like that. I always was thinking about you do a thing like that with the builds, for example, yeah. or, with, or with something like that. Just so throw everything in, and you will actually see in 200 dimensions how it maps up. You know, what's the opinion structure of, of these different builds? You have a few thousand builds, and you can see, like, actually, well, oh, these kind of rubrics of the builds, these concepts, these hang together. And then you can very quickly figure out, instead of having, like, one dimension, you know, left, right, uh, there are many concepts in a bill. And with that information processing, you can actually quickly figure out, like, how could I get a 50%, how can I get a majority? Like, what do I have to put together in a bill in order to get a majority to get it through, right? Because it very quickly maps it out. Uh, on these, on these kind of scales. And then only the Senate gets in the way at that point. But yeah. <laughs> so let's continue this conversation with you all to see what direction you'd like uh, Martin to take this. So we've got a couple people who have uh, microphones so that you can, um, so just uh, raise your hand and indicate to, uh, we've got somebody way up in the front. You get, get our exercise in. Um, this gentleman here was the first to raise his hand in the green shirt. Uh, one quick clarification. When you yeah. mentioned the 78% uh, of the 17 million voters that uh, Obama swayed of the independents, I think those were the numbers, mm -hmm. and you said changed their minds. Mm -hmm. Did you actually mean just impressed them in a certain way? Because they were undecided, weren't they? Yeah, they were undecided. Yeah, so they swayed them over. Yeah, Swayed absolutely. them in, yeah. in a way that might have been the way they already were. So it didn't like, it wasn't a 70% change of mind? Well, 50% were like this. And like, if they're undecided, though, on average, it would have been a 50-50 call. And at the end of the 16 million, 70 They could have been on the fence, right? They yeah. could have been on the fence. And this tipped them over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I mean, that's what the... You know, so if, it would, if they would have done nothing, it would probably be, again, 50%. Because if they're real swing voters, you know, it would have fallen 50-50. But it turned out it was 78, which is uh, different than 50-50, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah that's Thanks. good. Mm -hmm. Who else has got something? Um, Luciana over here. Hey, this has been very interesting. Um, so uh, I would like to press back a little bit <coughs> on this idea that um, an algorithm can be truly non-discriminatory, because you use this uh, this example, right, of taking uh, European versus African names, um, which is very focused on you know one kind of learning, uh, something that's focused on language. But you're, you're not touching on the fact that language itself um, can be specific to ethnicity, it can be specifically gendered, and a lot of that is baked already into the way we use language. Um, and that is not something that you can easily flag as being, you know, anyone can try this at home if you wanna do a Google search and phrase your question um, using, you know, hyper-academic language and then using slang, you get different results, right? Um, and this doesn't touch on uh, discrimination in like image re facial recognition algorithms. Um, so I wonder if you can comment a little bit on that because it's, mm -hmm. it's like very utopian to say that, um, that these algorithms can be non-discriminatory, but also wh whose, whose motivation will it be to fix them when the creators of algorithms are already a monoculture themselves? Yeah, right, no, that's a very, very important point uh, and a very good point. Uh, that it, it's not, uh, yes, it, it can, I, I think they can be, uh, like, let's say, they can be as, uh, even more discrim uh, less discriminatory than we are, right? If we exactly know what we do when we say we are non-discriminatory, right? If a Supreme Court judge really does something and says, well, these are the principles, then I can write an algorithm that does exactly that, number one. Uh, number, so it can be at least as non-discriminatory as we are. Um, uh, and, and second, even more, be, uh, in a sense, it, it, it better because we can take some things out. That doesn't mean that we still have to define what we take out. So when I said uh, we make non-discriminatory algorithms, it's we make, we make them non-discriminatory to these three variables. You have to define these three variables, right? So I said gender, uh, uh, race, and, and religious belief. And, oh, and, and why these three? Well, uh, because you know, the law gave them to us. Right, so the, that's just, we defined on these three, we don't want to discriminate, and then I can say, okay, uh, make your decision, but don't discriminate on these three. Like, what are these three? Th that's really from society to decide. Might be another society does say, you can discriminate according to that, because th that, that doesn't matter to us. And then how and what you discriminate and what you don't discriminate, and to what degree, 
uh, and in which sense, yes, that is completely baked into the decision algorithm, same as it is baked in any decision algorithm by a Supreme Court justice. So the, the, the difference is then that if you have it in a, uh, in a digital algorithm, you can open it up, and if it's open source, also discuss it, and I, I think it will be very important that these algorithms will be open source. So they have to be completely open source. Everybody should be able to look into them. Everybody should be able to exactly know what they do. And this new law in Europe that comes into effect at the end of the month uh, kind of like goes into that direction. They, I talked with the German government last week, and they have no idea how they're going to implement it. But this is this right to know uh, law, right? So in Europe, you can go now, starting from next month, and you can say, somebody, this algorithm does something and it took a decision. I want to exactly know how this algorithm got to this decision. So Facebook, you need to explain to me, or somebody who hires you, you need to explain to me how this algorithm made the decision not to invite me a job in, to a job interview. And, and, and the, the person who used the algorithm, uh, or the provider of the algorithm, then has to lay that out to you. Uh, so it goes in this direction of being transparent. But you're completely right. Yeah, these algorithms need to be exactly transparent. Now the good thing is we then know what they do. For example, there's this famous study also done by the same Krasinski, who started the psychoanalytic stuff. So he took, uh, I think that's what you're referring to, he took images on Facebook and, 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 and trained the algorithm to detect homosexuality. And it was very successful. Just, for, just from your profile shot, the algorithm could detect uh, your sexual preferences, just for looking at the image. Now the interesting thing was, now once we had an algorithm, and, and he just said, you know, I just showed that it, it's possible, and it is possible. You can detect sexual preferences just by the picture, uh, by, the, by the face, actually. It just was really surprising to many. Now, since it's the algorithm, what, what came off that is, we can look what the algorithm actually did, right? And then actually see, like, what does the algorithm actually do when it gets to this or that decision? Like, humans make the decision all the time, right? We just don't know. It's tacit knowledge for us. But we're kind of like making that implicit once we have an algorithm. We can learn more about why it's discrimination, what is discrimination. Now, the results we take from that can be extremely ugly or can be very useful. And that's still, that's a decision completely out and that's really up to us. That's not, the, the technology doesn't care about that, what you do with it. So the, the gentleman in the, with the yellow shirt right next to you, Mike, was next. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, just a very simple, well, maybe not so simple, but a very uh, short question. Is this a danger to um, participatory democracy? Are, are, we, are we going in a direction that could be um, construed such that a, um, a country or a government that is not so um, democratically inclined could take this information and really um, control just about everything? I mean, I'm looking at news from China where they have these facial recognition um, situations and um, who knows, I mean, prediction can be dangerous and I just don't know if you've had any thoughts or um, ideas on how this type of thing can be um, used by governments that are not so uh, benevolent. Thanks. That's a great question. Yes. Um, yeah, as I, just, as I just said, you know, the technology is always normatively neutral. It's just a technology, it's just a tool, you know, it's, uh, it has to be socially constructed. Just like a hammer. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna build a shelter to protect yourself, you need something equivalent to a hammer. Now, everything equivalent to a hammer can be used to kill somebody. That doesn't. It's not the hammer's fault. But if you wanna go on an evolution, you know, if you wanna be a civilization, we need to need something like a hammer in order to build us shelters. You know, otherwise we would be back with the animals. You know, like we. It's it's. It, it, but the hammer is just you know, and, and any technology is a tool like that 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 has to be socially constructed. Is it not technologically? It's not technologically deterministic. Um, in that sense. So it can be used for participation, uh, to go back to your question, it can be used for participation for a very good sense. So a colleague of mine in MIT uh, Media Lab, Cesar Hidalgo, he talks about this idea, he just gave a TED talk last week about that, um, how actually his idea would be to kind of like have an avatar for each one of us uh, that basically reads all of our digital footprints all the time, what we read, what we do on Facebook, who we're in contact with, what our friends think, and so forth. And this avatar then basically uh, internalizes our political views, right? And then we create this Congress, supplement or complementary to existing Congress, right? Where we send 250 million avatars 
And if a bill goes through, you know, these avatars then basically say, well, like, I'm busy. I have other things to do, you know, I have to think. So I sent my avatar to this, uh, to this hearing, and my avatar's like, no, like, my opinion would be like this. You have to change that or that, or it doesn't fly with me, right? So it would be a complete direct democracy, always updated in real time. Like, I update my, my avatar in real time, as all of you are, and we have this 250 million people assembly there, uh, avatars assembly there, right? Um, and, you know, these digital footprints exist. I mean, Facebook has them. Uh, why, and Google has them, why shouldn't my avatar has them and I send them to Congress, right? Um, so if they are a big benefit, and this is almost like direct democracy then. Now, uh, remind ourselves that the founding fathers of this constitution of this country here were very skeptical of direct democracy, right? Because, you know, the mob killed Socrates, right? So we need a, a mechanism to refine and enlarge, and that's why representative democracy was, was created. So going, we, we have a lot of tools for, for that, to make participation better, but also that's not, not, not the entire solution. We need also, like, representative democracy is more than just going back to Athens, you know, so to direct democracy. Um, on the other hand, on the other extreme, the question with, uh, with using, abusing that, yes, absolutely. I mean, the oldest vision of, of this entire scenario of the, what we call maybe information society or knowledge society, you know, it doesn't come from an academic, it comes from George Orwell yeah. in 1948, right? Academics. 84, yeah. or he uh, wrote eight, it in 48. Yeah. yeah, in 48 he wrote 84, <laughs> right. So the academics started to talk about the information society in the 80s. He talked about that in 48, right? And, and it, was, it was this kind of vision, you know? I mean, nowadays he would probably turn in his grave if he would knew what's going on, right? Because it's much more severe than he could have, had ever envisioned back then. Uh, already with, with, with what, uh, what the government industrial complex, that's how he called it, knows about us, right? So, yeah. Gentlemen, two down was the next, and then we'll come over here. I came, <clears throat> excuse me, I came in late, so I don't know if you've touched on this. But this is a question about, the, a highly speculative question about the future of artificial intelligence. This is the 50th anniversary of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and HAL. And uh, I think we're mostly familiar with the, the outcome of that. Uh, scientists have seriously thought that art true artificial intelligence can be achieved, not in the far distant future perhaps for the next 30, 40 years. What would happen to all these algorithms that you know, we, we nicely <laughs> plan and, and put into computers? When the computers themselves think and decide, well, about discrimination, well, maybe democracy isn't such a good idea. Maybe it's more effective to have, <laughs> let's say, uh, like Plato thought, you know, a, a philosopher king, or us, the computers, who know far more than these petty human minds. So, I mean, I know this sounds like science fiction, but science fiction has become science fact rapidly in the last 50 years. So. All right. Scott. Yeah. Wow, that's a big question. I mean, there are two, three things coming to mind. Um, so, obviously, the question is uh, with the singularity, right? So, um, I, I, do, I think it's complementary. So, there are two things. I don't think that artificial intelligence basically cares about replement, uh, replicating us or going to, but we say true intelligence. It's kind of like, you know, um, you don't have to figure out how a colibri flies in order to build helicopters. You know, it's just that helicopters can do things that colibri cannot do, and drones can do things that colibris cannot do. So it's not, like, we don't have to, like, oh, how does the brain work? It, it doesn't really matter how the brain, it, it doesn't really matter how, how birds fly in order for us to fly to the moon, right? So it, oh, if you have infinite, infinite human resources, get some people to study how the brain works, and maybe you can learn something from that, but you don't really need to. Once you understand the general concept of aerodynamics, you can build all kind of flying machines. You don't need to study birds. You can still do, but it's, it's just this one solution nature came up with, right? So same with intelligence. What is true intelligence is actually an interesting question because we have only like this one thing that mother nature came up with after tinkering, but that's, uh, that's basically it, right? So, so yeah, I, I, I think it's not like, I don't think it's the terminators and so forth. It's just a different kind of intelligence. And, and that brings me to the second point. It's, it's the singularity, it's not like we will have a terminator which will be like us and we, no. Uh, it's more like a jet plane compared to a colibri or a helicopter compared to a colibri and a jet plane compared to a condor, right? It's more like, it's more like this, that, that the difference will be. They're complementary, doing different things, similar in the same concept, uh, but complementary things. And I think this digital technology, what it's very good is, is it brings us together, especially talking about governance, right? It's kind of like the glue that stitches us together. So I'm in the Department of Communication because, you know, it's, uh, 
It's communication that holds us together, and that's what's being digitalized. Uh, laws are the same thing. They're communicative structures, laws, algorithms, you know, on this level. So laws is algorithms on this bird's eye view. And in that level, we already merged with the technology. I mean, singularity already happened. Uh, I mean, 80% of, of the transactions on the stock market are decided by artificial intelligence. 99.9% .9 of the decisions on the electric grid are made by artificial intelligence. And over half of marriages in the United States are decided by matching algorithms, artificial intelligence guided on dating sites, right? So if you tell me, hey, Martin, we found this new species, our extraterrestrial species, right? 80% of the resource distribution, 100% of the energy distribution, and 50% of the procreation decisions are taken by this thing called AI. I would say like, hey, yeah, that, that's one. Right, you guys already merged, right? You already, yeah, you, you, it's inseparable already on a, on a bird's eye view societal level. And that's what I do, society, right? Now, you could turn off your cell phones, never again be in touch with money because that's all digitalized, right? Go to the mountains and you will probably also survive without any contact to digital whatsoever. You will be able to survive for a few years, but under no circumstance can you claim that you co-evolve with us. Right? The human evolution has already merged on, a, on an evolutionary level. We already evolve, we already a social technological system, right? So you can step out, but you're not evolving anymore in a, in a biologically evolutionary sense yeah. with us as society, right? So I think singularity has already happened. And I think the biggest effects are from this bird's eye view level, because who cares about this brain? It's just one brain. It's kind of like, okay, you have birds and, I repeat myself, birds and planes, but you know, these are just different things that make a bigger whole. Yeah. So we're going to do one quick question, um, and then we, and the exciting thing is there's like, like wine over there. <laughs> we're done. The last one is the lady in the, in the, in the, in the middle here. She'll have the last question. Then people can, uh, can have at Martin. They'll be, he'll, he has no bodyguard. <laughs> okay. I feel like when I use Facebook, I can get it to make me aware of a lot of things that it might not naturally choose to by selectively looking at other things and liking them. Like if I read the New York, if I read the Washington Post, then I'll look at the Washington Times. And if I get things about uh, certain problems, I'll try to look out. And once I've done that, it just keeps feeding me from both sides. I mean, if I make a few choices, it'll just keep feeding me it. Right. Yeah, so, so that's the question how these algorithms work and how these algorithms are set up. So Facebook has set up the algorithm in order to, sh like what Facebook, what all these social media sites try to maximize is to keep you on the site as long as possible. All right, that's, and they have these uh, maintenance optimization algorithms. So YouTube and, and Facebook and whatever, they try to get every split second out of you to stay longer at the site because you have more interaction, more data about you, better ads and so forth, right? That's the business model. So uh, the, the easiest way to keep you on the side is to show you what you like. We know if we show you exactly the opposite of what you like, you will run, right? Well, you can try to confuse the algorithm, but your digital footprint is way too complete as to really confuse it, right? I mean, bots sometimes try to confuse that, and, and that's been the solution to it, but your digital footprint is from all the different, from all the different ads. It's not only on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is everywhere, right? Even if you're not on, you can download your Facebook data, you will see that most of it is actually not collected on Facebook. It is that if you don't have a Facebook profile, Facebook still has a data set about you, right? Uh, I invite everybody, just go, go to your email, go to the search function and type in Facebook. You will see that almost every email in your inbox has something to do with Facebook, right? So most websites have the Facebook pixel on them. So independent government, even other, they have the Facebook pixel. So they track you when you get there. So it's, it's everywhere. So, so they, they, they actually have a much too complete digital footprint. It has to confuse them with one or two, with one or two different likes, right? Now you can completely try to be another person, but then in, in a Goffmanian sense, you will become this other person, right? Because we are all actors. All right, okay, we, we, have to, we have to go to the reception. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> yeah. This is great. great. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.